Right, so my name is Zach Shreb Conti, and I'm a research fellow at the Alan Turing Institute in London. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Institute, uh, the Turing is uh, UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. Um, and as an aside, if you are interested in sharing your work in an upcoming seminar, uh, please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, now, for the format of the seminar, questions may be asked uh, after the talk in person by using the raise hand function or by typing in the Zoom chat. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Rakakis. I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, yep, yep. who is our speaker for today. So Chris is the VP of Modeling and Simulation at Julie Hub. He's also the Director of Scientific Research at Pumas AI. Uh, he's the co-PI of the Julia Lab at MIT and the lead developer of the SIML open source software organization. Um, Briefly, Chris has received various accolades and awards, including institutions such as NASA, the US Air Force, ACOP, and ISOP. Uh, so, Chris, the floor is yours, and thank you once again for joining us. Yeah, well, thank you for the invite. Um, yeah, so what I want to talk about today is generalizing scientific machine learning, right? So a lot of people, you know, when, when we started out, scientific machine learning was kind of nobody, right? But, you know, these days, a lot of people are doing this with ODEs and PDEs. And what I want to describe is, you know, what are the techniques that you can use to go beyond the standard models that people are doing? And what are the mathematical challenges of, of doing so? Um, I hopefully will we'll go along the way. I want to kind of describe some of the the you know, they give some insights into interesting bits about automatic differentiation, including cases where automatic differentiation fails uh, to actually work correctly, which I think is something that a lot of people don't really know. And, and so, you know, I want to bring a numerical analyst type of, of, of approach to how we're expanding scientific machine learning. Um, so first of all, what is scientific machine learning? It's model-based data efficient machine learning, right? So, um, you know, I think that for this seminar, most people probably know, but the, the general idea here is that, you know, you have physical laws. So for example, Newton's law of, you know, uh, uh, Newton's law of, of gravity or, you know, general relativity, right? You have these laws, which you might not necessarily have a 3 billion row good, giant data set that tells you that this law is true, but we, we know that they're true because there, there are thousands of experiments that have validated these kind of physical laws, right? Um, so we have a lot of this information that we have that is not necessarily in the form of data. And so what we want to do is we want to build machine learning architectures that are effectively using this non-data stuff as part of its uh, predictive power, right? Um, and you know that's a high level into it, and then we'll we'll go into a bit more detail here. And and my my core point across all of what I'm going to be talking about is that you know d differentiable simulation is difficult. It, it, it is not the easy way to do scientific machine learning, right? The, the easy way to do scientific machine learning is physics-informed neural networks. But the, the results that you get from using differentiable simulators tends to be a lot better than what you get from a lot of other techniques if you spend a lot of time and effort into it. And what I mean by spend a lot of time and effort into that, well, I mean that there's a lot of things that can go wrong when you start to mix in classical uh, numerical methods. And so there's a lot of stability analysis and things that you have to kind of worry about. And so what I hope to just convey in my talk, it, you know, th this is something that's kind of gathered over tons and tons of different manuscripts. And what I hope, hope to gather in my talk is just this high level view that you know you should be thinking a lot more about differential simulation but you should also be understanding the difficulties in, involved with it um so where's the starting point right so our starting point is a lot of the scientific machine learning that we do is with these universal approximator differential equations or universal differential equations the the general idea behind it is that you know a neural network is a function approximator, right? It's it's something that can um, approximate any Rn to Rm function, you know, if the neural network is sufficiently large, right? That's the universal approximation theorem. And so what we could do is we can write down mathematical models where if we don't know one of the functions that goes into our model, we could we can capture it via a neural network, right? So here, for example, is this kind of form of, of a lock Volterra equation where we say, you know, x uh, X prime, so the, the change in the number of bunnies, it grows, uh, number of bunnies grows exponentially. Um, the number of wolves dies exponentially. 
And then when you put wolves and rabbits and wolves together, something happens in the interaction. But you know, we don't. No, no one ever. No one knows what happens if you put rabbits and wolves in the same room. So let's find that out from the data, right? And and so it's it's a form of modeling where you write. You, you're essentially doing what you would have done as a physical uh, modeler, right? You know, you write down your physical equations or the chemistry that you know. But the, when you hit a point where you don't know a function, you just put a neural network there as a as a stand-in because of its proper to be able to approximate any arbitrary function, right? Um, now, the, you know, the, the schema then for the, the, for the UDE in general um, is this kind of form then where you say, okay, you write down what you know, you capture what you don't know via these neural networks, and then you train these neural networks on the time series data that you have, and then you use that, that as a computational representation of what you did not know how to model, right? You know, once you train this neural network, you, ha you at least have input-output pairs, right? You can, you have something they can query and ask, you know, um, you know, what is the derivative of the function that I didn't know, right? All, all these things, that, you know, that you don't know this function, but now you have a, a computational representation of the thing that you didn't know how to model. And you can start to, to, to do a, a bunch of analyses on it, such as doing, for example, a symbolic regression, be able to generate and autocomplete your model based off of some functional assumptions. And so that's the general idea behind the, the universal differential equation. And I like to, to kind of introduce it in a step-by-step -step process using some COVID models. So um, this, is a, this is a case that happened uh, very early in the pandemic, uh, looking at uh, the first 21 days of the pandemic. So if you just take 21 days worth of data and you just want to extrapolate forward, right? This is something where we want to say, okay, you know, with very small amounts of data, what can we do with scientific machine learning? Um, the first thing that you go is, you know, well, what about just regular machine learning? So, you know, U prime equals a neural network, that's a neural ODE, right? Uh, there's no prior knowledge in here. This is just standard machine learning, right? Um, so if we just say you you know you can be any possible function, what it will learn is that hey, there's a lot of different functions that can fit 21 days worth of early pandemic data, and so when you extrapolate forward, the prediction is not even close to you know what the what the pandemic is like, right? Now, the key there though is that we we didn't constrain anything about our function space, right? We just said u prime equals any possible function in the entire world, and it found a function that fits, and then extrapolate with it, but you know, we, we, we know more information than, you know, than the way that an epidemic will evolve is any possible function, right? So how do we encode this prior information that we know about uh, uh, epidemics in a way that is, you know, structured? And, and um, so this is what brings us to this uni universal ODE form, right? So here we have an SEIRD model, right? So susceptible individuals become exposed, exposed individuals become infected, infected individuals either recover or they die, right? And with this kind of model now, there's a lot of these pieces that we that we can write down. So, for example, you know, if you're if you're someone that does mathematical modeling, you know, or if you don't do mathematical modeling, you might go, oh, you introduce some parameters that you also have to learn. Well, the interesting thing with mathematical models is that a lot of times, when, if you have this kind of structure to it, you might introduce new parameters, but they can be they can be understood through alternative data sets. So for example, you know, what is the percentage of individuals who recover versus uh, recover versus die from this disease, right? You know, this is just one of these, these, you know, these are some of these parameters with, that are in here that you don't necessarily need to use your time series data in order to, to know, right? You know, you have prior knowledge that you can bring in in terms of other data sets and, and other aspects, you know, and, and use heterogeneous data to come up with this model. But what are we actually going to use our time series data for in, in one, once we have this other information in here? Well, the key piece that we don't know how to model with respect to COVID-19 is how do people become exposed to the disease, right? Because exposure was very different in, you know, Sweden where there was no lockdown versus China or uh, Italy versus, you know, what happened in the United States. Even the United States, red states versus blue states had completely different behaviors for the, the exposure uh, to, the, to the disease. And so so coming up with one functional form that fits into this, this piece right here of like, you know, the, you know here, here, here's the term that, that is supposed to be people become exposed to, to COVID-19. I don't know how to write that function down. And so what we do is we replace that unknown portion of this model with the neural network. And that's with the one piece that we use the time series data to train against, right? 
And now here with zero to 21 days worth of data, we can then extrapolate forwards. You can see that we're already doing a whole lot better. Now, one way to understand why this is doing better is you can think about it as, you know, we've ep epidemicified our machine learning, right? Um, you know, it's like we have it in the form of an epidemic model. And so therefore, you know, it has some idea of how epidemics work. And so therefore it works better, right? Uh, that's a high level, you know, wishy-washy, I'll say machine learning explanation of, of why this is um, uh, doing better. But there's actually a more clear uh, mathematical understanding of why this is doing better, right? You can almost think about this as it is, you know, th this entire thing itself, the solution to this differential equation is a universal approximator of some function space, right? Um, the, the neural networks that go, the neural network that goes in here is repeated here. You know, this, this, what, what we end up having here is, you know, this SEIRD output is, this is something that essentially is a neural network, but it has certain properties, right? The, uh, the, the, if you look at S, right? So if, if our neural network is, is, is something that is a positive, um, then we have, you know, so for example, take that absolute value of the neural network out output every time, um, then S prime is always negative, right? And so we've enforced that this is a, you know, th this is approximating functions for which S is monotonically decreasing. Um, and now E, because S is monotonically decreasing, E will go, first go up and then it will go down. And so E will have a single peak along with I, um, and then R will always be increasing, right? So, you know, this is, so if you think about this as a universal function approximator, it is a universal function approximator of functions where the value S is monotonically decreasing, starts off in a way that is exponential, uh, but E is something that has a single peak, yada, 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 right? We've basically described a universal function approximator over the set of functions that we tend to think epidemics look like. Right. And so I think that that's a more mathematical reason for why this ends up giving you a better function. Right. Because, you know, in, in general, in, in, in general, the, you know, the, the, the core reason for, you know, getting better performance in such an extrapolation case is that if you have the set of all functions, you know, and now we've narrowed it down to a smaller set, you know, that is, and, and the true function is within that smaller set, then, you know, by definition, we can only have done better with our, with our uh, extrapolation performance, right? So that's like, you know, that's, that's a more mathematically clear way to really reason for why the universal ODE is, is getting a better extrapolation performance. But either way you think about it, right, the fact that we've epidemicatized our neural network, or you think about it as um, something about subsetting the, the space of functions, which you're trying to, to, to learn from, um, either way you end up to the same piece where empirically we see that the universal OD will improve the extrapolation over purely using the neural network, right? Um, then the next piece here is then we, you know, once we have a representation of the thing that we didn't know how to model, then we could do a lot of prior analyses on that piece that we did not know have before. So here, for example, we say, okay, we've trained this neural network to capture the thing that I didn't know how to model. Well, after I've trained this neural network on it, let me put input values in there and get output values out and perform a sparse regression, right? Um, so uh, sparse regression then is, a, is an identification of a simple function that captures the, the captures uh, any possible, you know, data set or function, right? And so this is the function that it learns. Now, there's two things that we get from this. One thing that we get from the sparse, uh, sparse regression is that we have something that's actually interpretable and gives us some predictions. So for example, this neural network was allowed to be a function of S, I, and D, though the sparse regression only is a function of S and I. So what this is telling us is that this the this term you know the the exposure to the to COVID nineteen ends up being a function of S and I um, and not a function of the number of people who've already died from the disease, which is a mechanistic prediction that we would think is true because people who are already dead are not spreading COVID nineteen, right? Um, but this is something that we can essentially read off from the results of, of this process, right? That, you know, we don't know if it's necessarily found, say, the, the, the exact correct function, and I'll go into that in more detail, but it has captured high-level things that we expect to be true. It does tell us predictions about, you know, S and I are involved in this react interaction here, but D is not involved in this inter interaction, right? So there is a lot of interpretability we can gain from this form. But the other piece is then that we, this sparsification ends up improving 
even generalizability. Uh, this this is something that it kind of you can, you can relate back to to theorems and uh, with polynomial extrapolation that low order polynomials it tend to extrapolate better than high order polynomials. And it tends to be a fairly similar result that you know when you when you do the replacement of the neural network in the end uh, you do get a better extrapolation. So then you might ask the question, why do we have the neural network here in, in, in the first place, right? Well, the, the key behind this is, you know, doing a direct sparse regression would require that we, you know, do sparse regression techniques are really saying, oh, let's learn the whole function, but we don't want to learn the whole function, right? We want to bring in our prior information, and then we want to just learn the piece that we didn't know how to model. And a nice way to be able to do that is to use a universal approximator that we fit to gather a functional form for this and then perform that sparse regression, right? Um, and, and, and so you know, the, these neural networks then become this intermediate that we use to be able to capture these unknown functions in all sorts of different ways. And then what, what, what this talk will be about then is how we use this kind of form and generalize it beyond ODEs. And we keep generalizing it to cases where it's not even clear how to come up with alternative algorithms for doing this kind of function discovery. Um, so, you know, one, one thing that you might ask about once you start to see this is, well, you know, does this actually, you know, how much does the prior mo model help, right? So we did a study with Sandy and National Labs. I would, I would say, check out the, the you know, check out the, the technical report that, that's on this. The, the core idea here is that, though, is that, you know, as you, there, there's not just like one model, right? So if, if you look at this, you can go, well, what if you didn't know this term? What if you didn't know this term, right? You know, it, it, you, you have a continuum of models, right? You have a continuum of, I knew no more about my prior information and I knew less about my prior information. And the real question is, you know, as you intend to include more prior information, do you tend to be pr predicting better with the same amount of data, right? Um, and, and so what we did in the, in the study is we basically showed that the models, you know, if you build this continuum of epidemic models, then the one that is closer to correct will end up giving you better predictions than the one that is having to learn more. So for example, here's, here's the two extremes, the pure neural ODE, um, versus the QSAR, which is one that has a lot of prior epidemic information in it. Um, you can see that, for example, a pure neural ODE, U prime equals a neural network, doesn't even, you know, doesn't in even encode simple things like, you know, the sum of the population has to be equal to one, right? You know, any, not every ODE that you write down will actually have conservation of, of individuals. Whereas if you look at, for example, the, the, the model over here, you see that, oh, we actually have conservation, right? Because anything that's a minus has a, has a plus to it. And so conservation of individuals, if you, if you start it with a normalized value of S E plus E plus I plus R plus D sums to one, right? Then that summation is actually preserved. Um, you know, whereas that's not true with with the with the pure neural network or pure neural ODE. And so what we show within within this study is that as you go through this continuum of models, the models that tend to have more prior information tend to work better with less data, which is what you would expect, right? And this is uh, this is what we kind of plot out here that you know the more model that you pour in, the less data you have to in order to get the same good prediction. But it's it's a it's a it's a nice you know empirical study that basically justifies and says, you know, this thing that we believe would be true about scientific machine learning does actually work out in practice. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of the cases in that, that come up where, uh, where people have started to use the, 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 our, our techniques and software uh, for doing the scientific machine learning. Um, here's, here's one that is rather quite interesting, I found. Um, we actually have this as a, as a tutorial inside of the SciML documentation. So if you just go to our SciML uh, documentation, you'll find that there is this uh, discovering relativistic corrections of black, binary black hole systems. There's just a tutorial that, that does exactly this, this whole study. Um, it's just a standard use of the, the software at this point. But what, what, what they did with their study here was they said, well, you know, Scientific, you know, scientific machine learning is about learning the, the, you know, the extensions to the physics that we know. So what if we said, you know, we, we know how binary black hole systems work, right? So you have two, um, two black holes that are rotating around each other. Um, and for this binary black hole system, if we assume Newtonian mechanics in a rotating frame, these are the equations that are written down. And then there's some corrections to it. There has to be corrections because black hole systems are not defined by Newtonian mechanics. They need the relative state corrections, right? And so what you do, can do with that is, you know, you just say, okay, I know Newtonian physics. I, I have some data. So this data is the gravitational waveforms from the LIGO experiment. 
Um, I use a small amount of data. I learn what the correction, what the relative corrections would be on it, and you predict forward, and it predicts fairly well. Um, if you look at the tutorial and the SIML documentation, you'll see that it actually shows this inside of the face uh, face form, and in the face space, it actually shows that you know the the binary black holes or the binary uh, a two body system in Newtonian mechanics is an ellipse. Whereas when you do this with a with the general relativity form, it actually learns to be able to merge it towards the Lissajous pattern, which you'd expect from the perihedron of of Mercury, right? So. Um, Th this, this basically shows you then that you can use this in physical context to be able to say, I know an approximate physical law, please extend this you know, physical law for me with the corrections of, of some you know, more, more advanced system or something where it didn't drop off the higher order terms, right? Um, you know, so I'm, I'm, you know, I give a few talks. Um, uh, so this is one talk, and there's a talk from Julia Khan keynote uh, that kind of goes into a bit more of these examples after examples after examples of people using this, the UDEs in practice. Um, I'll say that at this point, you know, the thing has like 700 citations of people doing cool applications of them. So please check out one of these other videos if you want to see more validations. But I mean, at this point, you know, you can. I again have a talk that, that you know just basically uh, goes through and lists a lot of these validations where yeah people are using these UDs for you know earthquake safe buildings for climate modeling for chemical reaction uh, discovery for you know uh, using this in in um, in, in, in uh, airplane engines and all these kinds of cases so I'm going to say I'm going to stop this part and say there's more validations, go check out those videos. I wanna go into a bit more of the mathematical details though about how UDs work and how we're extending this beyond some of the applications that people are doing today. Um, so, so one of the interesting things with the UD, uh, UDE is that it allows for using some ge pretty general prior known structure, right? And so what I've written down before is basically like, oh, you know, I know part of the ODEs, but can we do this even if we don't know ODE information? Um, so, so here, here's a case that actually showed up in that, in that work that we did with Sandia. So the, 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 the core behind this is that, you know, let's say, let's say in, your, in our baseline here, we wanted to actually learn an SIR, uh, SIRD model, right? Susceptible individuals become infected, infected individuals either recover or die, right? Um, even if we don't have a lot of information about the prior, you know, different equations involved in the case, we might still have some information in terms of graph relations, right? So susceptible individuals uh, get infected, infected individuals either recover or die, and you don't have susceptible individuals that recover from a disease without ever getting infected from it, right? You know, these are, these are some you know basic pieces right but if this is this this is all the knowledge that we had could we use a UDE to be able to encode just this graphical structure right and this is what this is showing here so so if you if you instead say okay I have three universal approximators which you can also I mean in, in code it's just one universal approximator that is spitting out three values but you know the same difference um you know I could I could use just three universal approximators here and I say okay um, I have, you know, one neural network that is, goes here and it's opposite, you know, it's, it's opposite is here. I have one neural network here, here, and I have one neural network here, here, right? So I don't know what the terms are, but I know that whatever, whatever the, the, the decrease in S is, it, it has a corresponding term that is the increase in I. And the two decreases in I have a corresponding increases in R and D, right? And so, you know, with this form, I don't, I don't necessarily know any prior known dif differential equations, but I have actually imposed a, a structural form that is graphically correct, and it has some properties. For example, you know, I already have conservation of, of individuals here, right? S plus I plus R plus D is constant throughout this simulation. You know, for any neural network for any weights that I choose, is you know, if, if, if the ODE solver is is uh, sufficiently correct, right? I've imposed the, these properties just directly through the functional form. And one of the things that we can show is that, you know, if, if you know things like uh, Cindy, sparse identification of, uh, of uh, nonlinear dynamics, right? What we can show is that if we use this kind of form where we train the, we learn the neural networks, right? And then we perform the sparse regression on the neural networks, we can actually show that the results that we get uh, from doing this, uh, from, from imposing this form and then doing the sparse regression ends up giving us better results than just doing a pure sparse identification of dynamical systems. And so it is kind of, th this, this prior information is imposing something that is getting us more mileage out of the same data that we have. 
Um, and so this kind of starts to open your mind then of like, okay, you know, you, you, the, the, you don't necessarily need to do this in the way where you say, okay, I know a lot of prior differential equations. It's, it's more about capturing structure. It's cap about capturing whatever knowledge you have in whatever way you can. And then using neural networks as essentially a modeling tool for, you know, functions that are unknown, right? Um, we do this in, in a partial differential equation case. So in this case, there is a there there is a uh, chemical uh, there is a reactant that is bound to a reactor, and we're flowing the, this chemical uh, species over it. Um, I have a student that actually just gave a talk on uh, specifically on the, on this one that is recorded, uh, so you can check out a lot more information on this specific example. Um, if you check out the Julia uh, YouTube channel, um, he gives a talk on. Um, uh, Vinny, Vinny, uh, Vinny Sintas Santana gave a whole talk on the, this aspect um, as part of the DigiWell 2023. But you know, a, a quick view of this is that you know you're flowing this chemical over the reactor, um, and so we know the the reaction, we know the diff or we know the the diffusion, and we know the advection of the chemical flow process. And so we can write down the equations for the diffusion and the advection in this kind of normalized form to, to the advection speed, um, and. What we don't necessarily know is for new chemicals what, what the chemical reactions are going to be. And so we end up having this form, which is uh, a semi-linear partial differential equation, where we don't know the reaction term. Um, and that's the only piece that we don't know. But the interesting thing here is that, you know, if you look at it as a time series prediction problem, you know, learning from this amount of time series that this will be the future. I mean, you're not going to do that with standard machine learning, right? But that's pretty clear. But the the way that we're transforming this, right, it basically says, let, let's transform our spatial temporal data into data at every single time point of what the rate of the chemical reaction system, uh, what the rate of the chemical reactions are. And if we know that the, that this is how the spatial temporal flows occur, right, if we know this PDE, then all we need to learn is a R2 to R2 function. We just need to learn the reaction system. And if we only need to learn the reaction system and under the, the semi-linear partial differential equation assumption, which is that the reactions are the same everywhere in space time, right? Then we have a, you know, we go from something that has very little amount of data to extrapolate this to a lot of data, because now we have, you know, every single point in space time um, is another is another value for what for understanding what this uh, chemical reaction term is. And if we learn the chemical reaction term, then we've actually learned everything about this system, and therefore we can extrapolate. Right. And so that's how we're able to get this result where, you know, just from this amount of data here, we're able to extrapolate uh, with this, you know, dashed line uh, through the through the red squares. You know, this is we're effectively learning what the reaction term in the partial differential equation is. And once we have that, we have all the information to go forward, which is why, you know, that it, it looks almost weird in the, in the, from this from this view that, you know, that you're able to just use this time series to learn the rest of this. But really, it's because we just have enough prior information imposed. So that way, this information is actually predictive of the, the future uh, runs of the system. Um, now, when we do the sparse regression in this case, uh, you actually get a, a pretty interesting result. So what you can see here is that, you know, so we do this in cases with data, we do this in cases with, with simulated data, right? You need to use simulated data if you want to actually look into with the, the, the correctness of the recovery process, right? Now, when we do this on simulated data, um, where we actually say, okay, let's put in a specific function here, what you end up, what you end up getting is, um, you don't necessarily get the 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 uh, exact correct kinetic term uh, equations out in, inside of this form, right? Um, yeah, part of that is actually due to the symbolic regression, right? The symbolic regression might not even represent some of these forms that it's looking for. But one of the things that's interesting is that if you do a second order Taylor series expansion of the true kinetic equations and the learned kinetics, you'll see that they're pretty much spot on. Right. So what, what this is saying is that for the data that we that for the data that we've been given, we might not necessarily be able to recover exactly the same form of the equation that goes here, but we can uh, we can recover something that matches, you know, something that matches the behavior of that function. And you can use then use that to be able to understand, for example, oh, the, uh, you know, in this case, the chemicals are, are interacting um, because, you know, it, well, 
In this case, we have some self-interaction, Q, uh, Q star squared, uh, whereas in this case, we have that the chemicals are not interacting, right? You know, the, if, someone, if, if you actually look at the chemical reaction equations and the reaction rates, then you can go, okay, this is reacting, this is not reacting, and it's getting that information correct, even though it wasn't able to capture the full functional form. And so this is what I, this is this is what I mean by, you know, you don't necessarily get the exact functions, but it's able to give you something that's interpretable back to the chemistry, back to the physics, and back to what you would have needed to think about before with, with the correction of equations. Um, now, here's a case, uh, this case actually brings me to London quite often. <laughs> uh, so we've been working with the Williams Formula One team um, where you know, what, what we've been doing with them is, you know, this is um, um, for measurements of the speed over ground sensor. So as, as the car is taking turns, um, there's a speed over ground sensor that is kind of predicting what the orientation of the car is. And so they drive a bunch of practice laps around the, this practice track. And what you want to do is you want to be able to calibrate the speed over ground sensor. So that way, when you're in a real race where you don't have GPS information, um, someone can read the speed over ground sensor information to know the exact uh, the exact rate, you know, turn radius and, and orientation of the car during turns. So that way, you know, the, the control operator uh, during, during the race can call in and say, hey, you know, you keep on taking this turn at 45 degrees, that's uh, not sharp enough, you should be taking that 40 degrees, right? Um, so all that information, if you, if you watch these races, all that information is coming from, you know, race computer calculations, optimal trajectories, but it's all having to go through these calibrations of the sensor data that's on the field. And so, you know, what, what we've been working with the, with the Williams team on is the fact that they, what they had before was this Python, you know, PyTorch-based um, uh, Gaussian process where it was not giving that great of results for the, what these angles are, right, which makes it not very helpful for trying to figure out, you know, what, what angle the driver was actually at for, for giving uh, corrective predictions, right? Um, but what we were able to do is we were able to come up with a fairly simple vehicle dynamics uh, uh, form. And with that, that simple form of, of the vehicle dynamics, we could then predict forward and, uh, um, with the same amount of data. And so what you see here is that the car uh, uh, picture is the prediction of the, of the, uh, of the angles um, given, uh, given the speed over ground sensor. And the, the color underneath is the true angles as known on the uh, practice track, right? And you can see the version on the left, the Julia form, is, uh, the, is the form that's using this kind of scientific machine learning approach, you know, trained from the same data as the Gaussian process from Python. And you can see that it gives just much better results uh, because it's using just some very basic vehicle dynamics model as part of the way that it's doing its prediction process. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, so so you know, given that this is a physics informed machine learning group, um, I think that one one piece I want to kind of bring in here is that you know a lot of other scientific machine learning methods can actually be rephrased as UDEs, and that ends up being something that is helpful for software engineering, right? So you know, in software engineering, you want to handle you know, as many cases as possible with as little software as possible. And so being able to rephrase, you know, all these different ideas as, oh, this is just a UDE where you do this, this is just a UDE where you do this, you know, comes in handy. So for example, um, a discrete a, a discrete time physics informed neural network, so, you know, uh, like multi-step um, physics informed neural network is actually just a UDE that uh, within where you choose with the ODE solver and adapt uh, a fixed uh, time step on the on a multi-step method, right? Um, and these relationships then are useful then for designing the, the, the software. I think that one of the one of the cases that is really interesting in this respect um, is to look at this kind of example uh, solving high dimensional partial differential equations using deep learning by Hans Jens and Jensen and Wine and A. Right. And so what they were looking at is okay. I want to solve these these kinds of uh, per, uh, semi uh, semi linear parabolic forms. And the way to do this is, is you can use a relationship between stochastic differential equations and PDEs, um, in particular the backwards SDE. And so, if, uh, and so you, you can actually represent the solution to this PDE by the solution of a backwards SDE. And so th this ends up giving you a trick, yada, 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 and don't wanna go through all the details, but this ends up giving you a trick where um, essentially you can come up with a neural network architecture that if this trains according to this loss function, then you get the solution to this PDE, right? And so they represent this as, oh, you have this, you know, recurrent neural network and da, 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 da. The reason why I'm going over this fast is because there's actually a very simple way to write this down as a UDE. 
if you think about it as a universal uh, stochastic differential equation, you just say, okay, um, I have uh, I have some uh, process. So, for example, Black Scholes or, or you know uh, uh, nonlinear Black Scholes. I have some process here, and then I have some U process. And what I require is that I require that the that the this value function um, uh, at the end minus some condition on the initial condition that has to be equal to zero. And so you know this this whole algorithm that is th this whole algorithm that is some kind of of, you know, recurrent neural network and all this, it actually is equivalent to taking this universal stochastic differential equation and performing the Euler Mary, the fixed time step Euler Mariama discretization on this form, right? Which means that now we have a ready generalization. You know, how could you generalize their work? Well, you know, you can say, okay, now I use an adaptive time solver. I use a, you know, a, a higher order method, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if I don't know the full model, I can, you know, say, I don't know the full model here and also put a neural network there. But all of these extensions are pretty much free because it's, I mean, the, this method is just a universal SDE that has been discretized by hand as part of their paper, right? And so I think that this becomes, this is kind of an interesting piece because you can start to say, well, you know, there's a lot of different methods out there in, in, in the SIML literature, but one way to be able to capture them all into, into you know, single, single programs and be able to handle them all in a uniform way is to put them into this structure. And not everything follows this structure, the full continuous physics informed neural network um, is, uh, and, and continuous neural operators, for example, do not follow the structure. But th a lot of things where people discretize uh, can actually be written as a fully uh, universal differential equation form. And so we start to build the, the software in this form where we say, okay, let's handle these kinds of algorithms, you know, with these kind of deep splitting schemes and all these things, specialized things for high dimensional PDEs. Um, and they really just end up using the same infrastructure as the UDEs. And so they're actually rather small, compact packages because of how we've been able to represent them here. Um, so I think that that's just kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice mathematical fact that it's then useful for, you know, building out a numerical ecosystem. But um, the, the next thing here, though, is like, you know, okay, does this actually require differentiating the simulator? I haven't gotten to how we train these things at all. So here, for here, uh, a nice example to kind of dig into uh, for the differentiation aspect is uh, this case that we did with the uh, climate models. Um, it says that uh, this is an older version of this slide that preprints have been out there for a while now. But um, the the core idea behind this is that you know you want to you want to build a uh, for a climate model a GCM you want to build a, a model of the entire ocean, right? But the way that you modeling the entire ocean with three dimensional physics is fairly difficult. So you split the ocean into a whole bunch of blocks, just cylinders or or or, or, or squares, right? And or what, what you do with these with these cubes is that you really want to just you know you don't care about the x y direction. You just want to know how does heat flow up and down. Um, and so how do you approximate three-dimensional Navier-Stokes equation in as a one-dimensional heat flow equation? Well, this is something where if you don't have the neural network here, you know, this, this is a standard approximation and you write it out. Um, this is called the convective adjustment. Now the convective adjustment equation, normally what you do is you'd have these higher order terms. These higher order terms require they calculate other PDEs in order to get them. Um, and so you would normally drop them in a climate model. But what we do in this case is we say, okay, let's not drop them. We know that there's missing terms right here. Let's actually just chat capture them by a neural network and use the data that we have from a three-dimensional PDE solver, the three-dimensional three uh, Boston S approximated Navier-Stokes uh, simulator, and use the data from here to be able to learn how to approximate this, this neural network term, be able to learn effectively the, the closure to a higher degree. Um, now, how do we actually train these things? Well, the first way you can think about training this is that you know I want to I want to get derivatives here, so I can take dt dt. Well, I could I could use the average temperature at, along these slices and see how the average temperature along these slices changes over time. This gives me a data set for dt dt. I can invert my operators, yada yada yada, and you get a data set then for what the neural uh, for the neural network against the residual, right? Um, and if you do this, this you know, so so you can then do this without any differentiation of the simulator. You've now created a neural network. You now create a data set that says this is you know this you know this is what the right hand side is. Um, this piece right here is what the right hand side is expected to be without the neural network. The neural network should just learn the residual between the data and, and right. Um, 
Now, if you if you do that, you you know, so you train the neural network and then you stick it into a simulator and you, and you run it, what you see is you, is you see this divergence over time. It's actually very indicative to what happens if you only control the derivative, right? So if, if you know your control theory, if you only control the derivative, then you tend to have this kind of uh, this kind of drift over time. And so if you're to try to fix this in, in a control sense, right, this is the reason why we use PID controllers instead of instead of just derivative controllers. If you want to fix this in a control sense, you don't want to just control the derivative to be correct, but you also want to control the integral to be correct. And so this brings us then to this other form where we say, now, instead of taking instead of using the derivative data for, from our data set, what we want to do is we actually just want to solve the partial differential equation with the neural network inside of there and then use the temperature data from the, the simulator um, against the temperature data from the 3D Boston X approximated Navier-Stokes, right? And so in, this is what, we're what I'm basically saying here is that instead of using the derivative of the temperature data, we're using the temperature data itself. And if you do just that small change, you get about two to three orders of magnitude better predictions, right? Um, so this is, this, is a, you know, this is the key, the core change here that, you know, in, there's, there's the, the issue is that if you, if you try to do these things without your simulator involved in the loss function, all of these properties of your simulator are not captured by the, by the neural network. And so therefore it's actually learning in, in a biased way. But now once we have this, this loss function where it requires solving the, uh, the neural network defined PDE at every single evaluation of the loss function, you know, it's actually taking into account not just, you know, the, the convective adjustment equations, but also the issues of our simulator itself, or itself, right? You know, the issues of its, you know, the, the numerics of its time-stepping uh, scheme and all these kind of aspects. And so it ends up being a lot more numerically stable. But the trade-off here is that now our neural, now our loss function actually has, as part of it, you know, run simulation of PDE with neural network inside of there. And what that means is that when we actually want to do the great, take the gradients of our loss function to do gradient descent, we have to take the gradient of our simulation with respect to the neural network parameters. And so this is why differentiable simulation comes into play. You know, it's required to be able to, it's required because it is the way that we actually do the learning of these neural networks that are embedded into equations. Um, now, uh, you know, there, there's there's a lot to say then about uh, these different adjoint methods. There's not just one adjoint method. There's tons and tons of different adjoint methods because of all how they all compute differently. So, you know, the, the way I want to kind of introduce this is to kind of go through one example of how a choice of adjoint method can actually be numerically unstable. Um, and actually there, there's a way to be able to make most of them numerically unstable, even automatic differentiation of an ODE solver itself with no modifications is numerically unstable. And I'd be happy to give a quick derivation if anyone's curious. Um, I just put up a workshop that goes into that yesterday. Um, but okay, so you know, so automatic differentiation can have O of one error, even if the mathematics and the implementation is all correct. Um, so can adjoint methods also have this kind of behavior, right? So here's one quick example of that. So uh, it, here's a, here's a here's an adjoint method from the neural ordinary differential equations paper uh, from 2018. Um, what it says is that the way to calculate the derivative of an ODE is to solve your ODE forwards, then use the property that if u prime equals f of z, or well, this should say u prime equals f of u, um, sorry, but you know, if u prime equals f of u, then u prime equals minus f of u solves the same equation in reverse. And so if that is true, and then you, you, then you can kind of build this augmented uh, ODE, and it turns out that if you solve this augmented ODE, uh, the solution to one of these terms ends up giving you the, the, the derivative of your simulation with respect to parameters at the end. Um, if that is way too fast of an explanation, and if you haven't seen these adjoint techniques before, I would highly recommend uh, checking out um, some of these other uh, course materials that I've put up that goes through the full derivation of these things, right? But now, okay, how do we break this case, right? Because my point here is that, you know, mathematically, there's nothing wrong with this method. Numerically, though, there's a lot wrong with this method. So what, what's going on? Um, so, so, you know, th this, so this, this uh, method, rely, this way of calculating the adjoint, it uh, relies on the idea that if you do u prime equals f of, f of u going forwards, then u prime equals minus f of u in reverse gives you back the same trajectory, which is mathematically true, right? But it's not necessarily true for ODEs that are solved when they're solved in a way that is discretized. And what do I mean by that? We'll take a, cl a classic example here, the advection equation. Right. So the advection equation is this partial differential equation where the, we know the analytical solution is a wave moving to the right. Right. 
And there's two ways to discretize this. You know, you, you basically say, okay, yeah, I'm going to keep the DUDT term. I'm going to keep that intact. So I have an ODE at every single spatial point. Um, and how do I define that ODE at every single spatial point? Well, I just need to discretize DUDX, right? Uh, how do I discretize DUDX? Well, either you know, I either take forward minus middle divided by delta x, or I take uh, for I mean, middle minus uh, backward divided by delta x. Right? I take one of these. I write down one of these two derivatives as the approximation to DUDX. Right? And the question is, you know, do I am I free to choose whichever one I I want? You know, are, are these are both ways to discretize the same equation? Are they you know they're mathematically similar? Right? Are they computationally numerically? Are they both fine, right? It turns out this is a classic case where you can very clearly show that one of them is, is preferred, or preferred of the, over the other. Um, one way to understand it is that since the wave is moving to the right, you know, you would expect that you need data from the left that to tell you, you know, if, if the point, if you're, at, if you're, you know, you at the point zero here, you probably need to know what's happening at u of minus one in order to know how to update yourself, given that your analytical solution is that you will be the value over there in, in the near future, right? The wave is translating. So, you know, that's telling you exactly what your value will be in the future. Um, so given that information, one of these discretizations is only using information from the right. One of these discretizations is only using information from the left. You better be using the one with the information from the left. Otherwise, the analytical solution is not even in your update equation, right? Um, so that, that's the way I like to describe it. I mean, you know, this is, a, this is also a common example that you sit down inside of a PDE's course and actually prove with von Neumann analysis that if you choose the wrong direction here, you have unconditional instability, um, which means that, you know, for any choice of delta T, delta X, um, you have an unstable uh, uh, simulation of the system, right? But the core idea is that, you know, you have to choose the upwinding form. You have to choose the form here, which is using the information from the left. This other, this other way of writing it down will actually diverge to infinity, you know, uh, finitely uh, fast um, for any choice of delta x and delta t greater than zero, right? Now, I, 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 you know, the reason why I bring this up is because this is a great counterexample to this way of calculating the adjoint, right? Because if you think about it, this way of calculating the adjoint requires that if I solve this ODE forwards, then I should solve uh, the reverse ODE. Um, you know, I, I need to be able to do that as part of this adjoint method. But for this type of equation, if I solve it, you know, if I do upwinding going forward, so if I chose this form of the ODE going forwards, and then I naively say, okay, now I just reverse the equation, right? If you naively reverse the equation, you will have actually had to reverse the directionality and in the information. Otherwise, your, your gradient information is unconditionally unstable. And so in this case, you know, you, you basically have to choose, like if I choose to write things with this ODE, then my forward simulation is correct, but my reverse simulation has an unconditional instability in the gradient calculation. Whereas this one is just unconditionally unstable in the forward direction. And so it's unconditionally unstable in the gradient as well. But either way, this version of calculating the adjoint is, you know, mathematically correct, but it gives, you know, infinitely, you know, incorrect results on this type of equation, right? And so, you know, these are the types of things that, you know, numerical analysts is really kind of interested in, right? You know, where when can you write down things that are mathematically reasonable, but can just give you completely incorrect results? Um, and so, you know, you can actually ge now generalize this a bit more. If you're if you're curious, you check out this paper uh, called Stiff Neural Ordinary Differential Equations. It actually is not just a property of advection equations. It's any equation that has a sufficiently large, um, any equation that has a sufficiently large uh, 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 Lipschitz constant actually loses this reversibility. Pro uh, um, uh, this reversibility. So you can actually see that if you know if you just solve u, u prime equals min, uh, lambda u, um, and you do this with say you know uh, lambda being minus fifty, um, you know so you solve it forwards. You know so you do the exponential growth and then you solve it in reverse. You see that the error that you get is around ten to the tenth, right? Um, with say, I think this is just with Euler's method with a given case, but it's what it's really demonstrating is that you know the error that you get with respect to the Lipschitz constant grows exponentially with respect to the Lipschitz constant, and so this this idea of doing this reversal, right? This idea is 
correct, but it's not numerically stable, right? Um, and so you know, you end up you end up having to say, well, you know, there's different ways of calculating adjoints, um, and the reason why the different ways exist is because some are able to do things with less memory. So the reason for this form is that it requires less memory. It's a very good way to to be able to fit larger equations onto, say, a GPU, but you know. It's, it's less memory, but more numerically unstable. Whereas there's methods that have take more memory, but are less numerically stable. And there are ways that then require more compute that are then are, you know, not as memory hungry while being stable. So, you know, it's, it's almost like, you know, if you think about ODE solvers themselves, right? You have stiff ODE solvers, non-stiff ODE solvers, and, they, and they, they're used in different cases for different types of equations. Um, the way that you have to calculate derivatives of equations um, also has different methods and you have to choose different methods depending on the numerical properties of these equations. And so um, I'm going to skip over some of the details here. It turns out that some of them, uh, some of the ways of doing this actually grows cubically with respect to the number of neural number parameters. And so inside of this stiff neural ordinary differential equations paper, we go, no, no, you don't want to do it like a lot of the other literature has said, because you, 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 if you actually start to put a stiff ODE solver inside of here and you're differentiating, you know, you're using the stiff ODE solver as part of this differentiation process, then your LU factorization becomes size of parameters and LU factorization is cubic. And so there's, you know, so the, all these other issues come into play, which are dependent on the solvers that you're choosing and how they're interacting with the with the derivative equations. Um, but you know, the, the general idea then is that if if you can take any solver and create der calculate derivatives through them, then any kind of model where you did not know how to do something, you can put a neural network in there and train it using the derivative and gradient descent, right? And so what we've been building out with the SciML software organization is a whole set of all the different ways of doing modeling, you know, from ODEs and SDEs to partial differential equations and optimization, and even just, you know, nonlinear algebraic equations. And all these different ways that you can represent models, you can stick neural networks in there and differentiate the simulator in accurate and, and scalable ways, uh, you know, to be able to do this, this model discovery uh, process. I do want to skip to, to the end here. Um, you know, he, he, I mean, so there is a case where we did work with uh, Moderna for the COVID-19 vaccine, where we kind of used a bit, a bit of these ideas for then, you know, for helping the way that you can understand who's going to respond to a dose or whatnot. I've given a few talks that are specifically on that, so I'll, I'll skip over that for now. Um, I want to get to this, this final point here, though. Of, okay, can we generalize this differential simulation beyond continuous models, uh, where in, in, into cases where derivatives actually fail? So here's one case where derivatives actually fail. Um, continue, so, so chaotic systems uh, have this property where even, the, you can't even trust that you've simulated it correctly, right? You get a solution that, that is, has O of one error against the analytical solution uh, pretty exponentially fast, right? Um, and so what have, the way that manifests itself is actually as uh, the, the tangent space diverges as exponentially. That's a way of writing down the, the, um, what the, the Lyapunov exponent is. And so the, the optimum exponent is actually the exponential rate at which automatic differentiation accrues error. Um, and so on chaotic systems, you end up having that automatic differentiation is just completely bonkers. Um, but there's still something that you can actually do. Uh, there are these types of techniques that we call these uh, least square shadowing methods. And if you use these kind of shadowing methods to calculate the adjoint, um, you don't necessarily get the derivative with respect to the parameters, but you get the ergodic derivative. You get the, the derivative with respect to average quantities on the attractor um, with respect to parameters. And you can use this to be able to say, learn neural ODEs in context where the derivative is not necessarily well-defined. Um, and so we're kind of going this in this direction where you can start to say, okay, you know, chaotic systems have weird properties. Um, but here, here's another case that, that I want to kind of get to at the end here. Um, so, you know, how can, can you, you know, can you also extend this to cases like, um, you know, so let's say you have an agent-based model, right? Agent-based models are used all throughout epidemic modeling. What would you actually do if, if you don't know some of the functional forms in, in an agent-based model, right? So what we'd have to do is we'd have to extend this idea of calculating derivatives with respect to the you know simulators. This, you know, uh, so you know with traditional ID, the way that we would calc calculate the derivative with respect to our simulator is we would take our simulation process. It's just a function of, of parameters, and we would generate a new code that is effectively calculating the derivative of our parameter of of our function with respect to parameters, right? And as as I kind of alluded to. 
you know, um, if this is if, if our simulator is an ODE, then our process for calculating the derivative is also an ODE. If our simulator is an, a stochastic differential equation, our process for actually calculating the derivative is a stochastic differential equation. You know, it, so the, you, if whatever simulation process that we have, an augmented version of that simulation process gives us the derivative process. And so now if you start to talk about things like, okay, well, what if I have an agent-based model as, as my underlying representation? Um, well, you know, then you have a then you have a random variable, and can we extend automatic differentiation in a way so that way you know we take a program for a random variable and turn it into a new program for a random variable? But how do we want to transform this? Well, we want to turn this into a new program where the expected value with respect to this new program is equal to the derivative of the expected value of our original program. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So so if you if you think about you know the way that the automatic differentiates working, you know der derivatives are kind of calculated in this way of saying what happens when I do small perturbations, right? But what we can do to be able to extend this to cases where which are discrete. So for example, I want to differentiate uh, I want to differentiate the, the uh, a coin flip, right? I flip a coin, I get a value of zero or one, right? Um, you know. You can't perturb zero to be zero plus epsilon, right? They're, the coin value is it's either true or false, right? It's heads or tails. But what we can do to be able to calculate some form of derivative is we can say there's a small probability that this case that I had a heads actually turns into a tails, and there's a small probability that a tails turns into a heads. And if you turn any if you turn this into a program, what you can do is you can take these kinds of stochastic models with coin flips and all these different properties and transform them into new models, which are slight perturbations, um, which are heavily correlated to the original one, where then the difference ends up giving you a very high, uh, low, low variance estimate of the, uh, of the, of the derivative. Um, and so what this looks like in practice is you can start to write down these, these simulations where you say, okay, you know, X is, X is a function of P. I take a, a binomial with respect to P. I take a random binomial. Let's say I got out six, right? Um, I got six, but there is a sm infinitesimal probability it could have also been a seven. Um, and if you do this in, in a specific way, then you can start to extend automatic differentiation where you you take a simulation like this and automatic differentiation generates a new program such that it's a, the expected value of the new program is the derivative of the expected value of the original uh, simulator. So what you can see here is that we, we, you know, we run this augmented uh, simulation process using the stochastic triple. And then when we take a bunch of samples of that, um, what we end up getting there is a representation of the derivative, right? And what this means is that, you know, it basically gives us an automated way to be able to take, you know, not just uh, ODE type models, but now with things like agent-based models um, and say, okay, well, what if I didn't know the rate function that goes into this part of the agent-based model? Well, what I can do is I can represent that rate function by a neural network, and I can differentiate the, the expected value of the, of the agent-based model with respect to the neural network parameters by using this, this kind of, of, of uh, this kind of formulation of automatic differentiation. Um, and so here, what this is showing is that here's a version of a stochastic, um, uh, stochastic version of, um, of Conway's game of life, where there's probabilities of certain events occurring. And what this ends up doing is it learns what the correct probabilities would be in order to force the solution to be uh, to most readily be towards some output that we wanted it to give. Right. And so in the end here, this means that all the things that I talked about with you know ODEs and, and learning these continuous equations can be directly extended to all these different ways of doing simulation, these agent-based models and such, as long as you can find numerically correct ways to calculate derivatives. And a lot of the actual core mathematical work that we do within the Julia Siml ecosystem is all about accurate calculations of derivatives of all the different ways that you can do scientific simulation. Um, I think I'll stop there because I'm about at the end of time. Um, I'll mention here that you know if you if you actually look at scientific these differentiable simulation approaches versus things like you know deep O nets and neural operators, they end up being a whole lot faster if you've spent the time uh, optimizing them. Uh, but it takes a lot of extra work to do the code optimization because, as I said, there's not just one way of doing the adjoints. There's a whole it, it's like the whole uh, thing of stiff uh, versus non stiff ODE solvers. There's a whole different set of different ways to do these you know, derivative calculations and simulations and actually optimizing them takes a lot of effort. But I hope that you kind of under, you know, I hope that you walk away with this saying, you know, differential simulation is at least a nice, interesting, generalizable way of doing scientific machine learning that extends to all these different contexts as long as you can calculate derivatives.
So thank you. Thank you so much. Let me apologize. Thank you so much, Chris. Sorry, there's a feedback from my end. Okay, we're good now. Thank you so much once again. Um, and that was really comprehensive and really, really, really cool. Um, I'm, a, I'm a conscious we have oh, zero minutes for questions, but I'll uh, I'm, maybe there's a question in the chat uh, that I'll, I can read out to you. Um, Shabir asks, maybe tangent to the topic, are you aware of any SIML work uh, that also operates in Kalman formulations? Um, in common form formulations, well, so okay, so I give talk. Uh, uh, I, I give I give a talk. Um, let's see, the other day, and is, is this actually showing my 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 screen here, um, or is this uh showing the, the web page on the screen share? Or is it still showing the PowerPoint? Simulation. Um. Well, let me let me redo the screen share so that way it's actually just showing that that screen. Um. Yeah. So. If, if you want a lot more details, uh, so this is like, you know, I gave you like the one hour version, which is kind of high level. If you want the version that has some some derivations in there and such, I just put up this talk, automatic differentiation in SciML, what can go wrong and what to do about it, right? So this is the version that has, you know, derivations of how automatic differentiation of a solver can actually give you incorrect results, you know, even without adjoints, et cetera, et cetera. Um, inside of here, I actually talk about uh, some things like prediction error methods and other, other ways of actually doing this fitting process. Um, so, for example, the prediction error method is effectively this kind of continuous form of a common filter, um, which you can use to be able to stabilize the fitting of these neural networks. And I go into some, you know, derivations as to how that uh, ends up getting rid of a lot of minima inside of the the loss function space. And so, yeah, and, and so, you know, there's a lot of these techniques that you should use. And I would say, you know, th this this uh, video goes into a whole lot of the extra details. I mean, it's you can effectively think about it as the three hour version of this. Um, but yeah, so so the some common filtering stuff is, is described in there, right? Because yeah, the, you know, common filters are the analytical solution to the um, to the linear filtering problem, right? And so you, then you have to generalize it to the nonlinear filtering problem using things like EKFs. But then you know you can start to put neural networks in there, and you get a very similar kind of flow toward towards those kinds of of, of nonlinear cases. Thank you very much. We have another question uh, from Yin Cheng who asks, uh, great talk, may I ask a quick question? How, how does UDE compare with pins in dealing with partially known PDEs? Yeah, well, I mean, um, you know, th this is this is kind of, uh, in some other talks I've gone into this, um, you know, it turns out that pin pins are rather slow, right? I think it's like an open secret. <laughs> As some people have published some papers like saying, oh, pins are fast. I mean, they're fast after you've trained them, but they're really slow to train. Um, and it turns out that if you do differentiable simulation correctly, you know, but yes, you can solve the inverse problem with the pin simultaneously to the, uh, you can solve an inverse problem with a pin simultaneously to the learning of the pin, right? Um, and, and so that's shown in like a, some of like the, the original papers there. But it turns out that if you just have a very fast differentiable simulator, differentiable simulation is just so much faster than training the pin. That uh, like, so here, for example, I think that this is like a 10,000 times faster than deep XDE uh, for learning the parameters of, of a Lorentz equation, right? Um, and that's like the, the this is using the, uh, the tutorial that's in deep XD, right? Um, and then for example, with this deep O net, um, you have this example of, you know, oh, hey, you know, we can, you know, when it says it's outperforming a numerical solver, this, this is from uh, this paper, which I think Paris actually corrected this paper to have the, the, uh, the Julia OD solvers inside of there as well. So, you know, uh, if you want to kind of have a, a full comparison, he did, he did uh, modify this to have a version of them in there. Um, and but, but basically, what you can show is that you know, like the the you know the numer when we say numerical solver here, that means like you know the SciPy numerical solver. Um, the deep O net uh, performance is, is uh, well. This is a physics informed deep O net, which includes the training. It does outperform the SciPy solver, but that's just because the SciPy solver is rather slow, right? Um, so I, I think it, it ends up being a very interesting question because I mean, yeah, so if I could go into like this little part here, um, it turns out that, that machine learning is a lot easier to optimize code for than scientific computing, right? So if you have machine learning, you have a lot of these matrix operations, uh, matrix matrix multiplications. And so it turns out that with physics informed neural networks, 
uh, you just have O of n cubed operations. And so a lot of the things you have to consider when you consider like classical numerical solvers, you actually don't need to care about and optimizing at all. It's just, you know, make layers big, throw them on the GPU and that's optimal, right? Like, um, and you know, what this plot is showing is that you, know, you can do all these other little tricks um, like, you know, removing allocations and such, but the, the real difference is like tiny, like the, you know, the optimized version versus the unoptimized version is tiny. It's really just the difference of, did you put it on a GPU or did you not put it on a GPU, right? Um, so I think that what ends up happening is that you get some people who actually end up seeing that pins do okay versus their scientific code, kind of like what was seen in the in this paper. But the reason is because their scientific code is just very unoptimized, right? Because if you spend zero time optimizing your machine learning framework, you will get like within 3x of optimal. If you spend zero time optimizing your classical numerical methods, well, A, they might not be numerically stable, as I described, right? You have stiff OD solvers, non-stiff OD solvers, and adaptivity and all these things. But then B, the reason why you have, uh, have to spend a lot more time optimizing them is because scientific codes use a lot of O of N and O of N squared sparse operations, right? If you think about, you know, all the things that you do in the PDE solver, you're using a lot of tricks like, you know, uh, uh, you know Wilson's method for, uh, for solving tridiagonal systems and things like that, right? So if you solve a tridiagonal system with, uh, with the specialized techniques, you can do it in O of N instead of doing like an O of N cubed operation. And, you know, so you go, okay, I, I specialize that. But it turns out then also that a lot of the things within your computer, like memory allocations also scale like O of N. And so if you aren't writing very good code, you'll have computational overhead that you also have to consider getting rid of, right? And so, and you also have to do things like manual, man, manual, uh, manual uh, memory management, ma uh, uh, manual SIMD. You, you, all of these things actually matter, right? Again, they don't matter for the physics informed neural network because if you just do a matrix matrix operation, loss handles all of that and it's O of N cubed. So your memory, manual memory management really doesn't matter, but it does matter for your differential simulation codes. And so this ends up giving you this kind of funny result where, you know, some people, if you're just using like a high level Python sci-fi solver, right, you'll see a completely different result than, a, than an optimized code. Whereas the difference between an optimized physics informed neural network and a unoptimized physics informed neural network are much smaller, right? We're talking like 3x of 4x versus the difference in a differentiable simulator, which could be, you know, 100,000 times uh, performance difference given these details that I'm talking about here. So yeah, it's it's a it's a fun little detail. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I know we're over time. I have one tiny last question if I can squeeze one in. Um, general question: How do you deal with um, over specifying physics for real systems? So we talked about like missing physics, but sometimes you can over specify physics, and so your network has to like sort of unlearn um, the physics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, there was an interesting case of that that came up in the pharmacometric cases, right? So, um, you know, so in in the pharmacometric cases, right, you can start to, to um, you can start to say, well, you know, I have these. So in, this is a nonlinear mixed effects model, and you you can say like, okay, I, I believe that this is how weight and sex affect these parameters, which affect differential equations, and I have to learn them, right? So in one of these cases, if you actually put in here that you say, oh, you know, I believe that this gene affects whether someone will uh, have this drug. Right, you'll learn a neural network that ends up correcting your prediction, and when you do the sparse regression, right, you end up having you end up having like you know you're like plus you know plus one point five this gene, and then the sparse regression learns like minus one point one this gene, right? Like it learns the opposite of a term that you put in there. Uh, it won't necessarily have the the coefficient perfectly correct, like it won't zero it out, but it's quite a strong indicator that maybe this term that you put in there is actually not predictive. Thanks for that. Um, all right, I'll, I'll let you go and uh, let everyone also leave. Uh, thanks once again. Um, ah, there's one last. Okay, so it's, it's a nice comment. So uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining. Chris, thanks once again for sharing your work and for, for joining us this morning. Uh, just to know that mm -hmm. the talk will be available online, if, if you're okay with that, Chris. Yep, perfectly fine. I'll send, I'll send you uh, some paperwork <laughs> your way. Uh, but yeah, thanks again. And uh, see you all in the next seminar. Yep. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. Thanks.